morning, everybody. Thanks for coming to Retirement Seminar 2022 with Betsy Potter, Susan Inninger, Bonnie Napar, and Terry Gordon. Uh, take it away. Welcome, everyone. And we're just going to have a conversation about our experiences with retiring from MPI. And um, I've worked on this for a while uh, because I'd be asked if I would do this. And what I learned is some of the mistakes, I think we've all learned from our mistakes about retiring and we want to share them. And the first thing I would say is that MPI actually gives us a lot of information, but we, because we're busy, don't look at it. So I've tried to break it down so it's easier. So you don't have to hunt through it the way I hunted through it. And to be honest, a lot of it, I, I asked them the other day, when did all these videos go on? Oh, well, during the pandemic. So they weren't there when I retired. They are actually helpful. So the first thing I want to say is go to, come on, to the website, the MPI website, and click on things. Just click on stuff and see what it does for you. But what I found was that if you click on that, um, the one I stuck the arrow over that says resources, that's right at the top of the page. You don't even have to sign in to do this. It will then do a drop down that says educational videos. And to the right of that will be a thing that says pre-retirement. And MPI has added about 20 short videos um, that they have done about all the different decisions you have to make to retire. And the more you watch them, you can watch them all you want. You can go back and they, they do help. And I wish they'd been there, but they weren't. So that's just for you. If you don't want to read the book, watch the videos. It, it's there for us. It's there for us who are busy. Then at the bottom of the same page, if you scroll all the way down, you might have to sign on for this, but I don't think so. Under this, where I put the two arrows, it's the second thing, pension and IAP. You click on that and that will take you to this booklet which you can download or just read, click on it and read. And it has most of your questions covered. And I took this book and I have this in a way that I saved it myself, which I'm happy to share with others if they would like it. I broke it into all the sections that the book is because I remember looking at this book um, and just sort of glazing over was too much all at all at once, or I couldn't, I was in the wrong section. So the first thing I would do is go to the table of contents because it is like a little roadmap that they put there. Not necessarily clearly, I'm not saying that, but it's there. And step one is the retirement process. And that's the first thing I think all of us had to decide for ourselves. And those of you who aren't retired will have to decide. It's when do you want to retire? Why do you want to retire? Um, what are the conditions? Are they for health reasons? You just can't do this anymore. Are they for family reasons? You want to spend more time with your family. Are they because the kind of jobs you're being offered aren't what you want to do? They, they, they no longer speak to you. I mean, there are, there are subtleties within that but you should start thinking about it, I think, you know, a year or two ahead, because that's when you suddenly, I mean, I, I looked back because of this, I looked back and tried to remember, why did I retire? I don't know, because I'm working full time, not full time, part time now. And I'm like, why did I retire? Oh, oh, because I was scared that I wouldn't have my health benefits because I couldn't work enough to get my hours. Um, and it does happen when sometimes I had worked so much and then it just sort of like I wasn't being called. Those people stopped working. Whatever it is, it's not you. It's just the situation. And you have to decide whether you have enough health benefits to carry you forward and wait for something to come. So that is a major decision. Down below on here where it says general retirement, they break it into everything. Um, and all the reasons you might retire. 
but they are very personal about why you retire. So you want to make your decision well before you have to do it, because then you have a whole lot of forms to fill in for them. Um, this is a close up of that page that I did. Um, so step one is when step and then step two and three are what you're going to do. So they have in that book and actually on the website separately, a, a timeline process that they give us to help us because they know that this is a long and hard decision. And they say six to 12 months. So it is at least 12 months before you want to do it, you want to think about it. But it is true that it takes about three to six months to retire. And that's because three months are spent um, <laughs> for them to process our paperwork. It's not you, it's us. And two months are spent not working before you hit retirement. So it actually is five months that has to be processed before you can even hit. And, uh, and if you screw it up anywhere in there, they'll tag that onto your time. Uh, back. Go ahead. They will push you back and you lose time. So you, getting into it early is a good idea. Yeah. One of the complaints that I heard from a lot of people when I asked them about their experiences, the people who had retired, they all said, um, when I called MPI a couple of times, I got different answers. And I asked someone at MPI the other day why that happens. And they said it shouldn't happen but they know it does. And that's where I think you need to be as smart as you can about the information because they have a chart on you. Don't think that they don't have your work hours listed, the years you're in. Um, that was one of the things I found was that when I went to the website now, I don't think this was there. And do you, if you look up your work history, there's an arrow that you can click on at the top, takes you to the right and it will tell you how many hours you've worked and how many years you're vested. That is what is their truth. And if you have an argument with that, you need to research that before you get into the retirement phase, because if you have a, you disagree, you're going to have to, you're going to have to prove it. And I actually had to go back to Sony and get information and they were able to give me hours. In the end, I have to say that MPI was right. I was, wrong because I didn't realize what hadn't gotten recorded as work and I couldn't change it now. Um, they also have a chart that they give us on all these. This is what takes so long, among other things, all these forms and legal documents that you have to turn in. Um, if you're married, if you're divorced, if you're not married. I mean, I never thought I had to prove I was not married. I thought that was a really strange one, but okay. Um, and if, if those don't agree, you know, that's a problem. So once you've decided if you want to retire, um, you then go back up here to this second, the first, uh, the second choice, step one, step two. And you have to decide how you want, a, you know, your pension plan. And the pension plan, um, I mean, I was, I'm a single person. I didn't have a lot of choices to make. But if you are, let's see if it's over here. I don't think I made a. There's, there there's four, four choices. But they only <laughs> list two. Hmm? They only list two choices. Right? Well, in this. Okay, but if you go, let's see, in my, I have this. Let's see if I can share this with you too. Yeah, there, um, it is. there it is. It's up. Pension. This is the book. I have the whole book broken down into pages. If anyone wants it, I just found it easier to jump to the different sections. So this is the. They have four because it depends on the reason you retire. Right. Okay. Um, I got to get rid of that. Oh, dear. Oh, go back to PowerPoint. Okay. 
Um, what's this sheet go? Okay. Okay, that's the next thing. Back up here. Um, let's see. Sorry if I'm a little, but I've had to learn so much and now I succeeded in forgetting a lot of it. <laughs> so the screen that you're showing now, Betsy. Yeah. Um, it looks just, it, it's based on, as you said, the decision you made. Right. And primarily based on what age? Well, it's your age, how many hours you're, you've worked, if right. you rested. And also, as I recall, now I have to go again to this book. Sorry. Um, it is the pension we're talking about. Yes. Choices. Yes. Okay. So there's, so here, can you see this? Do you we see can this? see retirement benefit categories. Oh, you don't see normal retirement pension. Let's see. How do I get this to you? Hmm. Well, you can read it to us. No. Okay. All right. So they have it in normal. They have it divided by qualified 10 years, 11 years, how many hours you worked. Um, and all of, so you have to, this is the, probably the most complicated section and mm -hmm. there's a formula for it, which they have, which I don't think any regular, a, a computer might figure it out, you know, and someone who's working for them, but truly that is where you go in and say, if I retire now and I want to do a normal retirement, what will I get? And they can figure it out for you and you can believe it or not. Um, then there's early retirement pension benefits. There's also unreduced early retirement, um, reduced early retirement, special retirement. Um, there's so many little facets that that's where I really do think looking at who you are and what you need, um, and it depends on the age. So if you're 55 to 64 and you have 20 or more qualified years, you can do early retirement. This is where it gets really, I, I, and then there's disability retirement, which is retiring because you have to. And I didn't, I didn't even, to be honest, look at that because I hope none of us have to do that. That's basically, and then there's late retirement, which is what I did is I retired later. And then I found out that I could have, well, I don't know that I could have done this, but you don't have to retire. I, I kind of thought, well, I retired because I wanted my health benefits kicked in. So I retired from MPI, but not from the IA. Yes. Okay. That, yeah. You that's, that's, a, that. dis, that's a distinction that I found out. Yeah. 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 But you could actually, if you have the coverage, you can continue to work. And if you do that, here's the difference. If you do not retire from MPI after you're 70 and 70, 70 and a half, you will continue to accrue money from your work into your uh, IAP and into your pension. They will continue to grow. Ha but I, because I retired from the I uh, MPI, I get a lump sum at the end of, at, at the beginning of the next year for whatever the employers paid into my pension that can, into my IAP that can no longer go into my IAP because it's closed. I have it. Does that make sense? With a specific amount. Yeah. Right. So it's variable every year and it's only if I work. Otherwise, it's it's a non-issue. But I can never make my IAP go up. You you get your IAP at the end of that two months work stoppage. So like mine my work stoppage was Oct is October, November, beginning of December, my IAP is available to one, either roll over into my IRA, which I am doing, or you can do the annuity, which most of us don't recommend. And those yeah. of us who have done that can speak to that. Yeah. Now I- For clarity I though, your IAP doesn't go up, but does your pension go up? Yes. So if you, if you retire from MPI? Yeah. 
And you and then you go back to work. I don't believe so. I haven't seen any change in it. Oh, really? Well, where is this money coming from that you're getting in a lump sum? It's because it, the lump sum came to me. The, the money in your IAP comes from employers. Right. Yeah. But your pension only, I have to go back to, I have to get back to the screen. There it is. Sorry. Um, but the your pension is from your hours worked and they don't, uh, they don't change it. It only goes up. I don't know. I, I just haven't noticed can I, it up at all. Can I clarify something? For yeah, everyone? please. So that money, so the employers pay two things into your pension and your IP. They pay 6%. Hold on. Can you guys not hear me? Yes. No, I can't hear you. Okay. So, so your, the pension, the IEP is 6% of whatever money you make, right? So that's what you're getting at the end of every year. You're getting that 6% um, that the employers would have paid into your IEP, but now you're getting it as a lump sum because you no longer you closed out your IEP. The pension, which I was told does not go up, um, is a amount hourly that every employer pays into the pension. And I think once you, once you, once you retire, it's closed. I've, someone told me that it does go up, but I've like you, Betsy, I've never heard that it does. So that money that they're paying into your, uh, pension probably goes to fund all the other people who, you know, the pension has to always be funded. So I'm sure that it's just going into the ether. Yeah. Because I, if you don't get that raise. Can I say something? Can can you hear me? This yeah, is Joe. Yeah. Um I have been getting my pension the last uh since COVID. Since COVID started, I was told it does not go up. And mine is very small because I haven't worked as much as you guys, but I found out that unless uh, you guys vote at the next negotiations for cost of living increase, our pension stays the same, which is unfortunate. So unless it comes up in the bargaining next year or whenever you guys go to negotiate, then um, maybe they will approve a cost of living increase. Well, we, we always bargain for that. So yeah. It hasn't people happened. who retired before 2008, um, they have a 13th and 14th check that we always bargain for. So their pension, without they will never get a cost of rate like living increase because they're the way it was set up, they can't. But what we do bargain for is that 13th and 14th check for them. And then you could have just started so or because you retired in 20, right? Yes, 2000. Yeah, well, the bargaining was 2021, so you may not have been affected by it. So do you think there's a possibility moving forward? That yeah, we always, we always try and bargain. We always bargain for it. So it would be, instead of a monthly increase, it would be for the 13th or 14th month? No, no, no. no. That's for everyone before 2008. Oh, okay. And okay. then everyone after 2008, it would only be a 3%. So, you know, it's exactly what, the members get. So if we only got 3%, then the retirees would only get 3%. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. 3% of our pension check. Yeah, this is for the pension check, not the lump sum. The IAP. All right. Let's yeah. go back. If we go back, because we kind of skipped into IAP and yeah. I hadn't actually gotten there yet. But if you look at, this is where I like the table of contents as your guide, because they have normal retirement pension benefits then they break it down early they have all of the possibilities right there in front of you plus reemployment of they actually so when i called them up and said blah 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 they said go to page 26 <laughs> the answer is right there and they were right you know but i didn't know to go to page 26 um a i hadn't read the book and and i didn't realize that there really was so much in it and uh you can print, you don't want to print the whole book, I guarantee it's 56 pages long and half of it doesn't apply to us. Um, but that's why I broke it down to the pages that uh, that really do apply. And I, ha I actually wrote in my, my pages, I wrote 
which pages these are, but you, you can read them. I just am not that smart. I just wanted to write it down for myself. Anyway, but so, so the first thing you do is decide you're going to retire. And remember that until you sign the paper that you retired, you can change your mind. Circumstances could cause what, Bonnie? I'd like to tell my story about this because what happened to me is I was coming, I was starting the year that I knew I would turn 66. So a few months before I went in, that's when you could go in and talk to a person, which thank God, I loved talking to a person. She talked me through the whole thing. And I said, I just want information. What do I have to do if I'm going to retire when I turn 66? And I had three interviews scheduled, but I had, um, I had been into my bank and I only had 287 hours left in my bank and you need 400. And I said, well, I don't think I'm going to need it because I've got three interviews. I always get I always get a pilot. And she said, well, you know what? You should go ahead and start it. And if you get one of these pilots, we'll just stop it. And I'm so thankful that I did because here I go on three interviews and they hired two of them hired girls that I trained when they were straight out of college. <laughs> and I was like, well, you got great girls. They know what they're doing. But I didn't get a pilot. So that's what kind of, thank goodness I did that. I did all the paperwork that they say takes three months and it does kind of what, by the time you get all your um, certificates together, your marriage certificate, your divorce certificate, your, you know, everything together um, and submit it. And then they take forever that you really do need to start at minimum three months ahead is my opinion. I'd like to pony on to Bonnie's story. Um, I started this process in January of last year, um, just because, oh my gosh, who, everything was so volatile and up in the air. I thought, you know, I just need to, and everybody in my, my uh, stable of friends was saying, oh, you know, you should do it now. And at my age, it seemed sensible. So I started the process. And because I do have, I had all of those forms to fill out. And I, I got half of it done. And I realized, well, I have to wait, I have to talk to our financial person, Henry had to, we had to go off to the notary, there were things going on. So I had half of it done. And uh, life happened, work happened. And I thought I had turned it all in. I had only turned in half of it. So <laughs> I came to June and I had lined this all up so that my my bank of hours, everything was going to be finished by the 1st of June. It was going to start my Medicare and my my um, my my pension and all of that. It was all lined up. And I kept waiting and I thought, why am I not hearing from anyone? And finally, they sent me this letter that said, well, because you missed the deadlines, um, you now cannot retire until October. Well, the end of September. I had totally missed the deadline. Um, now I had a problem because I had no, uh, all of my, um, my um, medical was, my hours were gone. Uh, so I had to pay into Cobra and okay. had a chat with them about that. I, you have to have Medicare Part A and B when you retire if you want to keep your uh, retired uh, health plan. So luckily that was all in place, but I needed my secondary. So I went to Cobra and uh, so I had to restart the whole process learned my lesson, made sure I had all the ducks in line. But if you have a financial planner or someone who's handling your your all of your um, retirement issues, uh, they have to be on board to sign their, their portions of these. And they don't understand MPI. And our guy, I had several conversations with him and he said, I don't understand. What is this? crazy deadline what's going on and I said 
it's the entertainment industry. We are a whole different planet. And these are the rules. This is what I have to do. I have to get you guys to sign all of this information about the IAP and it's rolling over into my IRA. And he finally, and I, and I gave him MPI's number. I said, I could be totally insane. <laughs> Why don't you call them just to verify what I'm saying is true? And so he did, and he called me back and he was just like, <laughs> but we got it all done. Finally, everything's in place. Um, but do make sure that you have part A and part B of your Medicare in place so that your your benefits are all covered. Brigitte has her hand up. <coughs> Brigitte? It's an accident. I don't even see how I did it. Oh. So let me take it down. <laughs> Sorry. So just in that point, you are required to sign up for Medicare at what age? Well, whoops. Well, I kind of freaked out when the whole Obamacare thing was going on. And they were saying, if you aren't signed up by age, I think it was 65 at that point. Um, I signed up far too early for both. But by the time you uh, really want to do this, make sure you have A and B in place. And I think it's I think it's six. six I, it, it's now. 66 now. Okay. Because Gayla told me that you're required to, even if you're still working, sign up for it. Is that true? Yes. 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 Yeah. You have to pay for that. So it's like we've had free insurance our whole career. And then at a certain age, we have to, we are forced to pay for insurance. But you only pay, maybe I'm wrong, but I only had A. I had. Yeah, you don't. Yes. Right. Yes. I, when you retire, you, they just take B out. Well, yeah, you, you do, (laughs) they take, well, they take they take that Medicare payment out of your um, Social yeah. Security benefits. So when you get your Social Security check, they've already deducted your Medicare portion. But you need to realize that because say you're getting two thousand two dollars, but when you act, you think you're getting that, you will be getting one thousand seven hundred and eighty nine dollars or whatever the payment is. You know you're actually going to get it because they will have just sucked that right off the top. It's $300 a month. from. No, no, that's, that's like A and B together. And I don't know. That's just a surmise. I'm not giving you an actual number. Yeah. But it's, it's more than you want. (laughs) Yeah. It's a couple of hundred. It's based on your previous year's income tax. Now Um, they do revamp. They do change. That changes. If you change your income. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Correct. Um, another thing I, I wanted to make sure I told you was that um, when you retire, you theoretically go on to retiree uh, um, medic, uh, Medicare. MPI. Oh, MPI, MPI, retiree MPI PhD. Yeah. yeah. Which I did. But then I went back to work. And I did enough hours that it kicked me back to active. Oh. And the problem there was that MPI did not tell me that in any way. And I was not aware of it. So you need to be aware that if you do, I believe it's 400 hours in the six month, just like the normal rule, you kick back to active. And suddenly things like your prescription company will say, oh, we don't have you in the system anymore. Sorry, we can't refill that. And you have to go and go, no, no, no. You, you call MPI, what's my number now? And they they actually said to me, do you have your old MPI card for when you work? Oh, God. I said, yeah, I do. He said, pull it out and use it. It's reactivated now. This was, to me, not a fair game that they were playing because, but now that I know it, I, I get it. So, so far I've gone back to active again and I've stayed there, but at some point it will slip back to, retiree. Now, the other thing I learned, and this will only work if you happen to retire, get Medicare and Social Security, and you're at that that age, um, and you are going in to see a doctor or something where you have a copay, they will say, well, your copay is either say it's $30 for this thing, or it's $5 usually. I go, oh, no, Medicare is my secondary. They go, oh, you don't know anything. 
mm-hmm. which is lovely because I'd rather give that money to charity because I'm already paying for the service, I feel, um, for my years of work. So it's not a lot of money, but right now I've been going to a lot of doctors and this and that. So it's nice to just just say it. If they say no, you say, okay, I'll pay. Who, you know, you can pay it. Of course, you're prepared to pay it, but don't, if you're using the online MyChart UCLA system, they will ask you to pay before you come in. Right. Don't pay it when you get there because you can have a discussion. Yeah. Once you've retired, it's not always true. What the, what's up there? Huh. Um, another thing note I found in the book, um, and this is from MPI, is after retirement, if you requalify for eligibility in the active plan, which is what happened to me, um, on the basis of hours, I can't read, um, you get transferred to the active plan. That's in this little teeny print, and I don't even know where this is, to be honest, but I found it. Um, too late now, but I learned it, and I just want you all to know. So are you saying that then you stop paying for Part A and Part uh, Medicare while you because you're, you're active again? No, you don't stop paying any of that. I mean, someone told me, to be honest, Sal, I haven't called, I'd have to call Social Security and say, I don't want to pay for Part B anymore. But if you do that, you will get penalized for the rest of your life. I did look this up. Yes, I've I've heard this. Yes, once you, yes. It's not enough money to fight about. It might seem, you know, it just, these. Just keep it. These businesses, these groups are dealing with so many people who are not the CDG. They are just other people and they are just frozen in their system. And you you could kick yourself out of the system, you know, right. somehow. So, so let's go on to step three. <laughs> so step three is deciding and telling them how you want your IAP. And so down here um, are the, there are three choices. Yeah. We should talk about one thing when you do retire, like I just did it, you know, at 66, I retired, I I get social security, I get my MPI, I get, I'm done. I've got my pension. I got the lump sum and we're going to talk about later and I get a monthly. The, The thing is I took a lot of jobs. You can't take any jobs for two months. That's a given. Right, nothing. I do take jobs. I'm sorry, Bonnie. Let let me refer. You can't take any union in our business. Yeah, yes. in our business specifically, you can't take any entertainment jobs for two months after you retire. But then I started getting called, you know, to come shop or to come uh, pull things, and I found that. You're allowed now, they changed it. Now it's 49 and a half hours. You are allowed to work Mm -hmm. 49 and a half hours without going out of retirement. Now that's a month. A A month. month. A month. 49, you can, you're allowed to work it. And the thing you have to know is the month isn't from the 1st to the 30th. You've got to look it up and see where your particular uh, retirement is broken because I actually worked um, two 49 point, well, then it was 39 hours back to back for somebody. So I actually worked two weeks, but I only had 39 hours in each and I was able to do two weeks back to back. So it's just something to be aware of. Don't think it's from the first to the 30th. And that's only till you're 70 and a half, I believe. And then you can work as much as you want all you want yeah it just- i have a question what happens to those hours that you worked the 49 hours where do those do the employers contribute to that and no. where does that money go it's- no, they do contribute if if there's enough it go you get the money in january of the next year because it would have gone into your iap but it's only that money yeah you want, and it's, and i think there's a, a I think it's an amount limit if you work under a certain amount or over a certain amount. Is Jacqueline St. Anne here? No. 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 She's like, you know, fully retired from everything and has a full time job at FITM. And it's just, she's busier in retirement than she was when she was working. Well, FITM is not in our union, though. So mm-hmm. that's not an issue. No, but I'm saying she's, I think she's past 70. So she's full. Well, yeah. 
I, I Sal, one of the things we talked about was that sometimes just that's what happened to me in the sense that I had two years of nothing, which is why I retired from MPI. And then I started pulling on shows and doing things. And I, I worked on shows for the next three years. Um, and the and it was too late for me to add any of that money into my IAP. And then while you're working in retirement, your social security and pension checks stop, right? No. No. Not after, not. Well, your I, pension check does. Pension stop, does. But only right. up to, again, that 70 and a half age. So if you, I retired at 66, if I wanted to take a job, a full-time job, I'd have to call our call our union and say I'm working, and they stop pay, they stop your pension payments, and then when the job is done, you call them and you say I'm I'm back on retirement, and all it takes them about three months to catch up on the paperwork again. So, but it is retroactive. Retroactive. The so, other thing, Bonnie, did you have to fill in forms for the MPI to tell them that you weren't working and you were working? Because I had to do that. I didn't, I never worked that many hours. I made sure I would stay within the hours were allotted. I didn't, I didn't even try to work. So. But at 70 and a half, those hours, that 49 and a half hours doesn't apply. Exactly. Doesn't so where I'm going to be at. Um, going back to the IAP. So that, the big question that everybody talks about, I mean, there are a variety of options that go into why you choose what you choose for the IAP, but um, they want you to, they, they, many years ago, they used to come, MPI used to come and do seminars for us. And there was somebody there, who they, they were for a while saying, you should get an annuity. And I've had friends recently who've been told you should go into the annuity, but Later, when I went to one of those seminars, they said, don't do the annuity. Don't. Now, you can roll your, your, what you're getting from the IAP into an existing IRA or create a new IRA. Um, I actually did something different because I have a financial advisor. And I took the lump sum as a check. They put it into my uh, financial group, which is Fidelity. And then I split it into the IRA and part of it into a mutual fund. You have, the only reason to take the lump sum is it gives you control over it. If you're good with money or have someone to help you, great. It also has to do with taxes, doesn't it, Betsy? It does. Um, so you wanna put it into the IRA, or maybe, you know what, now that you're saying that, I probably rolled it into the IRA and then took it out that way <laughs> because, and put it into the mutual fund. You're absolutely right. Um, so this brings us to one of the issues that people often don't realize with the IAP is that um, you, you pay, if you take the lump, you pay 20% tax. They just take it off. Uh, Even if you roll it over? Not into the IRA, no. With the IRA, you can leave it sitting in there till you're, uh, now the rule has changed. There is a new rule. It used to be 70 and a half. There is a new rule, which of course I can't find, but it's called the Secure Act 2.0. And it raises the retirement of the date you have to take the RMD. And as of, I believe, 2023, it is 75, I'm pretty sure. No, that this, means, that's later. Huh? That's later. That's, it's, what do you mean? It's later? Uh, the date's wrong. I think it's like, close it's not 25 it's later than that well let me see i have it printed out i will go to it right now uh, and i do that and it's you know they just want they don't want all your money to sit there and without being taxed so once you reach whatever the age is now for me it was 70 and a half and whatever it is now which is increased and i think it's 73 well, now it's 73, but it's going up is what I'm saying. Yeah. But what yep. year is it? Okay, go away. All I right. know. 
I know you sent us all that. I'm sorry. I know I sent it to you and I even printed it out. And of course, you know, I have so many papers here that. So I, I just want to clarify. So um, what you're talking about is the RMD, which stands for required minimum distribution. And that's from the IRA. Yeah. That's so you rolled your pension money that has not been taxed. You put it in your IRA so that it wasn't taxed. Correct. The government wants their money. So there's yeah. a oh. percentage. Yeah. Every year that goes up. Like I think it started at 3% and the next year it's 3.5%. Next year it's 4%. It keeps going up how much you are required to take out. And your tax person will tell you. But yeah. the, other, the other thing we talked about is it can change your tax bracket. Yes. And suddenly you have to take out this lump sum. And depending on how big your IRA is, it's not your, uh, you might already have an IRA. I had an, you're right. I had an IRA and I put the money in. So it made it a bigger IRA. So the lump I had to take out is bigger. And yes, it affected my overall income for that year, which made my taxes go oh. up. So even if you roll it over, it's still considered taxable income? When you, at a certain age. You roll over and it's not taxable mm -hmm. until you reach 71, what is it now? 73? It's 73, but I believe yeah. it changes next year. Until you reach 73, then you are required. It's a required amount that the government is demanding you take out of your IRA because they want you to pay taxes. Right. They don't want you to have all this tax-free money. That you can put it right back in the IRA. Really? Yes, you can. Nobody tells you what to do with the money. You can take That's a vacation saying, long... with it. You can, I put it in Wall Street the first time I got it. So, but so the thing is that if, even if you take the IAP and put it into my personal IRA, I still have to pay taxes on it in that transfer? No. No, 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 no. no. It's no, okay. it's, you at, only, it's at a certain age. Do you want me to read this, Betsy? I found it. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, the original SECURE Act increased the age at which point workers have to start making withdrawals from their retirement accounts uh, to 72. The SECURE Act 2.0 would increase it once again to 73 by 2022, to 74 by 2029, and finally to 75 by 2032. Yeah, 32. You're right, you're right. The, the point of RMDs is to give the U.S. Treasury the chance to, uh, to start yeah. collecting tax revenue from tax-deferred savings and keep them from becoming an estate planning device. Many Americans happily take their RMDs to cover living expenses, and the extra three years would primarily give wealthy retirees who don't rely on RMDs for income more time to avoid tax liabilities. Yeah. It is an estate planning tool. I use mine to fix my sewer pipes. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was, but I was really glad I had it. When that, that Secure Act 2.0 is not in the IAP book yet or just is in it and they may not even be aware of it because it's changing 22 and you know so i just learned that myself it's too late for me to do anything with it but it's not too late for people retiring in the next yeah. year i'm one of the people that says do not use an annuity yeah. can you tell can you explain uh about well that? i put forty thousand dollars in an annuity and then i kept equal amount somewhere else. And they guarantee that when I when I want the money, when I want to take out the money or when my beneficiary takes out the money, that there will always be $40,000. There won't be less. And they say that it goes up and down just like sort of like stocks, but you don't get your choice of how it goes up and down. They said you could possibly earn enough that it's higher than $40,000. So actually it's mine always kind of hovers around 38. I've never gotten it up to 40. So I just don't feel that they're worthwhile. I think once you are of retirement age, they're worthless might work for people that are younger that can build 
If you look in the book, Bonnie, and this is where I, I don't know what happened with Bonnie's and I can't speak to it, but there is something in the book about um, that the annuity is handled by Mutual of Omaha. It is outsourced. Mm -hmm. and it's not Mutual of Omaha. So that's why I, whatever it is, either the rules have changed or the group that's handling it has changed, but it is Mutual of Omaha. And they say you get a monthly be amount out of it, which is the only reason I can see that you would do that is if you need to have both your social security, your pension, and something coming to you monthly, you would maybe want to do that, but you have no control over that money. It is just not the way to go. Yeah. I, you know, uh, do you remember when we had, it was like women's panels at the, at the Mondrian? I think it was Mondrian. Is that the one that's on Canon? It was like eight or nine years ago. And you could sign up and they had different panels, like six. It, it lasted for a weekend and they had six different panels that you could choose from, like that were an hour long and maybe there were three in a day. And the next day, the same thing. And I did take one on financing and the woman that was into representing financing said, do not do an annuity. And I forgot that. <laughs> and so, because it was before I retired. So I don't know. I'm sorry that I did. Just so for clarification, this is the IAP, not to take an annuity, take the lump sum and reinvest it on your own. Right. But don't roll it, roll it, roll over. it into an, an IRA. Free. It can be any tax free. It doesn't have to be an IRA. Just right tax-free like i'm incorporated right. so i have a, i have a corporation so as opposed to the individuals who can only put was it five thousand dollars a year into your ira as a business for my employees i could put any amount last year i put fifty thousand dollars in because it's for my employees um and so it's about like taking our iap and rolling it over into one of our personal investments if we have them um, one of the things I just found the note from uh, the guy from MPI, yes, he sent me about the question I think Bonnie asked is after 70 and a half, a retiree can work as much as they want without going out of retirement. And he answered with the response, which is something that we just have to deal with. They use the same thing the IRS does, which is this formula, which is the April 1st following the year you turn 70 and a half, MPI uses that also. Um, and so it varies, it's April 1st, not a half a year later. You, you just have to sit, I, I'm not even gonna try to go with it, just read it in the book. It's just annoying, but both social security and MPI use this rule. And yes, it does come out to about 70 and a half, but it might, if your birthday is in the, right or wrong spot, it might be a year later. April yeah. 1st. Yes. I, for, that's me, the thing. for me, it was yes. April 1st was a month before I, before I. So right. it's tricky. It and worked for, It worked for me. And yeah. I, I was told, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I was told that because my birthday is in July, I have to wait and i um, I have to wait till 2024, mm -hmm. I think. I have to go back and look at that. But he said something like, your birthday has to be before June or by June, by the end of June in order to be eligible for that April starting to work full time or as much as you want. So I have to wait till 2024 to be able to work. And I, I don't you think that they're they're just syncing it up with Social Security. So they're both on the same page. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. But it's still something to note. Yeah. Um, another note someone asked me is, can you take a loan from your IAP? And the answer is no. You were allowed to do it during COVID for some reason. Yes. That period. But in general, the answer is no. Yes. Um, and I don't, it's probably, we're probably out of that period. Well, I think, yeah, we were allowed to take out 
up to $20,000 or something without paying taxes mm. or or without a penalty. Yes. yes. That was That's only during was, the pandemic. Without a penalty. It was just that period, though. It's not a rule. It's a yeah, no. That was only for pandemic, and that's over. It's yeah. over. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the reason why my annuity is with someone else is I put everything. I rolled everything over first, and then I put oh. an annuity. That's why I'm not with Mutual of Omaha. I'm with a different company. Um. Okay, let's see. What was on my next screen was choose how you receive your IAP. We sort of talked about it, but there it is, the lump sum or purchase an annuity. And we kind of did this, what's on the screen, I'd say. Yes. Um, one of the other things I wanted to let you know is there is on um, the MPI website, this book as well. Uh, it's actually more easily accessible. This uh, the, the main book says 2017. This, I think, this is January 2022. So this is more updated, but I started to use it and look at it the other day. And honestly, it confused me more because in their attempt to consolidate and condense, I think it's only like 12 pages long, it, it didn't go into all the details. So... I would say use them both. There's clearly something they updated in here that they thought was important. Um, I just, I, I sort of like, you know, going to school, looking at your textbooks and just burning out on the subject after a while, you can just lose it. And I lost it on that one, but it's good to know that they're both there. And there also are a few other videos tucked away on the website that MPI has other than that group there's some others that Sharon does. Um, they're a little stiff. But the good thing with the video is you can run it back again and listen to it again and say, oh, oh no, he actually said this, you know. Um, and since it's coming from the people who really run the MPI, you have to assume that their answers are correct. So I think at this point, we kind of have to say, are there any questions? Are there any other comments that I missed? Bonnie, I mean, um, Terry, you had said to me something at the, make sure we say something. And you don't know what it is either. Okay. I don't remember. I, you know, we may have, I may have said it when I, I mentioned the, um, uh, the social security and part A and B, because that's crucial. But um, oh. Wendy has a question. She's asking, does anyone have a suggestion for best monthly income source for IAP once it's rolled over? Social Security and IA pension will not provide enough for me to pay bills, so I must need another fixed income source. And I was just replying to that, and it changes so frequently, you know, where you're, where you, you have to weigh, do you want to be aggressive? Do you want to be secure? Usually if you're doing a secure investment, it doesn't, you don't have as much um, return on that money, but you're also dealing with volatility in the markets. Uh, my husband just took some of our money out of bonds, which we felt were secure and, and doing well, and uh, had them diversify the portfolio. And, you know, we had a great day the other day. Um, had they stayed in bonds, we would have still been losing money. So does anybody else have any answers for Wendy on this issue? I don't have somebody that I think is good. But Becky, um, Betsy well, I've, I've used um, Fidelity Investments since I was 13. <laughs> I lived in the East Coast and that they started on the East Coast. And as I moved across the country, I it was not very good when I first moved here. But today, Fidelity has offices all over Los Angeles and pretty much around the country. And they've been good because they have different forms of investment. You can just do a checking account. You can have a, a, a debit card with them. I don't do any of that. Well, I did, but I don't. Um, but I at some point, if you have enough money, they they sent me to 
when I retired, they gave me a retirement counselor. And that's who put my money into a, uh, what was the group? I forgot. I keep forgetting that. That's Mass Mutual. And that was uh, sort of a very safe place. And the rest of my money, quite honestly, was in the stock market. And I have lived through watching. It depends how strong you are. Because lately, you can see it. You just lost a lot. But, you know, I, I did have the fortune of inheriting some money from my mother. And I woke up one morning and the stock market, half of it was gone. And it took about 10 years for it to grow back. It just depends on what you can seriously live with. Because lately, it goes up and down and up and down and if you want out, don't do that. There are safer things. I've also moved into real estate because right now that's the hot thing. But I also, you have to look at what it is you're investing in, what also speaks to what you stand for. You know, I know that's weird, but if you invest in something that makes great returns, but it's a really nasty company, you might not want to do that. Um but Fidelity, so they gave me this investment person. I put that money in that mutual fund. The time was up this year, this, this month on the 11th, on today, in fact. I had to decide whether to reinvest it or take it out. And so now, however, Fidelity sent, had sent me like two years ago to a small but very nice investment group that handles, that I really talked to about what I want to do. And they said, we can get you more because the mutual fund was making 2.5%. I can now get something like 4% on the same money and still not be uh, in sort of precarious. Yeah. Yeah. It's very solid investments. So there are ways to invest. And what they say to me, which I don't quite, I don't use it yet, but I do know this to be true. If you need, you tell me how much money you need mm -hmm. every month, or you tell me if you have a major, a new car you want to buy or whatever it is, and we will decide which things to sell off or how to do that, that is best for you. Because it's a group that doesn't make any money if I don't make money, which is what you want. And plus they all, they all say you should diversify your portfolio. So you have a little here that's safe and then you have some that's skyrocketing and maybe a little aggressive. And then you have something else that's giving you some return on your investment, but maybe not as much as you would like. Yeah. <laughs> Another thing I think that we did talk about amongst ourselves, and I think it's quite important, is if you're 66 and you're thinking, should I retire now? I could, but I should I? You might work quite a bit between 66 and 70 and a half or whatever it is and really bump your IAP up and your pension up if you can do it. If you can't, you can't. That's, it's not a, but it is often, oddly enough, a time when you suddenly are doing more. Um, I don't know whether you're more relaxed about what you're doing, but people I know are just often called on more and I don't I can't answer why it just seems to be true and if that should if you think it's going to be true for you then hang in there um but it really makes a difference what you make in those years and the other reason being simply that wages are higher per hour now so you actually make more money no matter what if you work in the in the uh entertainment industry um, all right. Any other thoughts, ladies and gentlemen? I mean, ladies. <laughs> and this gentleman. You're um, a gentleman. Yes, you are. <laughs> so just for clarity, we would we could theoretically get Social Security, our union pension, and 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 uh, income from our investments. We pay taxes on all of that as income. Yes. 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 And that's where your income touch. You know, I always thought that the point of an IRA was to take it out later in life when you had less income. So therefore you didn't have to pay as much tax on it. It doesn't seem to be true. Right. Because I mean, 
I've this is my 30th year in the union. I'm at 74,000 hours. My IAP is 325. I mean, I'm looking at retiring in 10 years. Um, I will have 90,000 hours, probably, you know, $450,000 in my plus my personal. My income shouldn't change in retirement. So my point to myself is like, why work past 65? Well, you know? that's that's an interesting thought is why why give them more money? But, you know. Well, there's a lot of people think you have to think about your lifespan, too. Like, Well, that's the other thing. The reality is, look, I mean, you know, if you retire at 70, are you going to have 20 good years? I mean, I would hope so, but I doubt it. Not everyone will. No, well, that, every that is part of the discussion with yourself about when should I retire? Right, because my whole point is like, I want to retire while I'm still young enough to have fun. Right. Good idea. And I mean, look, I mean, if somebody, I mean, look, you know, if Mindy still calls for a commercial and I can make $30,000 in a week, sure, I'll do that occasionally. But yeah. I think it's a matter of, <laughs> you know, look, I just came off of two big shows in a row. And, you know, my, I, and to see that I've worked 74,000 hours, it's like, we're putting in 80 hours a week. What are we, what are we doing to our bodies in the yeah. 70s at 80 hours a week? So yeah. that's why it's just sort of like, it was like, you're too young. I'm like, yeah, you want to retire when you're young. So that you're not, you know, look, I'm mean, retirement to me isn't not working. It's just not working 80 hours a week. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, that, that's to me, the whole point of thinking about why you want to retire. It's like, I want to be able to say no to a job because I just don't, I want to go on a trip or I want to just, you know, visit my family or whatever it is. And you can't do that. Once you're on that job, you're like, your life is gone. We all know that. And, and what kept me going at just before I retired was, short-term things like prepping shows. So that was great. But then those stopped calling and then it was like, okay, I give. And then I went back to work after a certain amount of time. Yeah, the great thing about it is picking and choosing um, the project you want to do and the people you want to work with. Yep. So that's getting smaller and smaller. You know, look, I'm not going to name names here, but there's a certain designer who's 90 who had a stroke and mm-hmm. went back to work and then one day had to have some procedure on her on their heart and then went back to work that afternoon. I'm like, that I don't want that life. Oh. Oh. I mean, good. God bless if you if you're you know that active. But I look, I think that with the pandemic, because I've always been a workaholic, I've never taken time off. Exactly. And, and the pandemic was like, you can't work. And it was great. Yes. I, slept, <laughs> I cooked, I read, I painted. It was like, oh my God, I'm so ready for retirement. Now I mean, it's still yeah. 12 years off, but the pandemic taught me that I'm okay doing nothing. And that's mm-hmm. I think what you have to learn is like stop work being workaholics. Yes, mm-hmm. I was I was in that same boat. It was like, oh, this isn't so bad. Oh, yeah. It was a no-brainer. But but you both have worked a fair amount and there are members who haven't worked a whole yes. lot. And that's the difference. I think that if I didn't, because I've talked to some of my colleagues who don't have 70,000 hours and yeah. your income will be much less. So I understand. But, and I, I think that's the point. If you can financially, sure. I yeah. don't want to, you know, and the thing is that even in talking to my investment guy, I will have about a million dollars in my investments and I will live off the income. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. So I'm not spending that down. He's like, no, this is part of your income. I'm like, so then I'm going to die and leave somebody a million dollars. Uh-uh. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I don't like my family that much. Oh, yeah, I, was, well. I was fortunate when I first, my first job here, um, the, manager of the star who had asked me to come do the job said to me the show ran i think nine years she said if you do not have a house and a car a new house and a new car because i had a really old car by the time the show is over that is irresponsible of you and all the work you're doing that was thank i mean she's not around to say thank you too but thank you because it really was important um, and I, it's very hard when we're young in the business to think about saving and where we're going. And I, I don't know how you can sort of make someone who's young aware. I was very fortunate when I got in the union in 93 on Stargate, it was non-union show. So I had hired a big crew to work in the workroom. And there was a gentleman named Richard Smart who was in his late 60s. And he got in the union on that project. And, you know, we had talked about retirement. He's like, well, no, I'm not going to, there's no way I'll qualify for pension. You know, this is, I've, I've worked, he was did theater his whole life. Well, 
unfortunately, two years later, he had a massive stroke and he couldn't work. And he was destitute because he didn't plan for retirement. Mm -hmm. And that jolt, you know, 20, 30 years ago made me start planning then. Because the thing is that you do little bits, little bits for 30 years is easier than a lot in 10 years. And mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's why I'm saying that the fact that there's no young members here, they need to understand this. Like, this is what you start, you know, we make a good income, put a tiny bit away early so that it's a lot when you're retired. Yeah. But Especially now when it's so hard between the price of gas, the price of rent, um, all of these things that are just eating away at people who are working their income. But it, like you're saying, it could be it could be twenty dollars a week. But over years, it will add up. Yeah. I mean, and also it's like knowing about like a friend of mine is a production designer, retired at 70 had a partner who was 20 years younger. Um, and the way they divvy out your income, it's either it's 100% and then your partner gets nothing, or it's 50% and your partner gets half, or then, it, and anyway, so he retired and three years later he died, the partner gets nothing because he was getting the full pension, you know, those little details. Right, that's, that's those decisions you have to make about that are in the book. Right. It's how much do you want them? Do you care about what they get later? Do you have someone... Yeah, you know, and then like you were saying, there are decisions about where does that money go afterwards. Um, and I'm at that point where I'm thinking about that. And quite honestly, my accountant says to me, "Well, you give too much away." So what I do? Oh, this was a tip I want to say is that she told me to do this. I donate money to organizations not from my checkbook, but from my RMD, from my Yes, before my RMD goes out, which is the money in my IRA, I have the institution send the check to the organization. I don't pay tax on that money. It lowers the amount of money that I then get and I don't pay tax on that. Does that make sense? That's cool. Yeah, and that's a, a nice little thing that you can learn that, um, and, and, I mean, maybe you're giving $100 a year. I, I actually was giving money to some organization monthly, and I, I actually have to call them up and say, listen, I'm not going to give to you monthly anymore. I'm going to give you a lump out of this account, you know, but it saves me money. Because the thing is that as a corporation, and this is why everybody should be incorporated, look, I pay like 12, 14% income tax, and, <laughs> and a, an individual doesn't. Yeah. theoretically in retirement i'll no longer be in a corporation so my tax bracket's going to go up because i'm going to be paying as an individual yeah mm -hmm. yeesh but don't you have to have I, my daughter's a corporation but she's a freelance photographer mm -hmm. so i've never considered myself someone that could even become a corporation if you're making at least 130 120 a year you it's it's worth it for you to be a corporation yeah because the tax write-offs are ridiculous. Because the thing is, remember, they took away all our deductions. I have them all. I've never, I mean, I've done better, in, uh, you know, since this, because it's like, I can write off. If I watch a movie, it's a write-off. Yeah. yeah, we used to be able to do that. Right, well, but that's why you want to be a corporation. I mean, like, yeah. there's a certain costume designer who shall remain nameless, who is a producer, and all of that income was paying 40% tax on it. I'm like, why aren't you a corporation? Oh, it's too much work. I'm like, it's not too much work. You'll make a fortune. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not, that, it's not that difficult. You find somebody, it costs about $2,000 for them to file everything. And then, you know, it's just, it's, I can't imagine, especially now with my Disney income, if I wasn't a corporation, I'd be screwed. But once, as you said, once you retire, that all changes. That's what I'm assuming because I'm no longer, unless I pay. Yeah, but you'd I still know. have your bit. I, you can still have your business. I mean, this is what I'm looking at too. I have is, to talk to my accountant about that. Like, can I right. run my my retirement income through my business? Yeah. I know I run so, my real estate investments through my business, through my corporation. So, so so I have a, I, I just want to ask, is Wendy still on the line? I wanted to ask if, if we answered her question. Um, because I know the, the whole concept of investments and finding somebody, a financial advisor that you're comfortable with, that's all a big challenge also. 
Yeah. Is Wendy still with us? It looks like it. it there is like no it. easy yes. answer. Hi. I'm still here. And, oh. and thanks, Susan. Hi. Um, I have, I, I've, I've got one financial advisor and I've interviewed another one that I like. Um, I've started to do a workup <laughs> with my profit and loss. Um, but honestly, I really want to manage that myself. And, you know, rather than pay someone, you know, this, my current guy wants like two and a half thousand to do a workup for a projection for retirement, uh, yeah. with, you know, they've reduced it now to one, but even then like either that, or, you know, I'll be put into some other investment, which I'll pay fees for. So I'm just trying to be a little bit frugal on that and manage it myself. So I thought maybe someone knew something like is putting it in a term deposit for a year, a good idea. Um, and then, you know, being able to live off that because that would be what I would see as a guaranteed income because you know how much you're going to get at the end of the term. Where I've, I just find with the last year or two of the stock market, and investments being wild and hairy, there's there's no predictability there. So, but that, and that's part of the, the nature of, of investment is that there is no predictability. It's yeah, that's yeah. Why you so, really want a financial advisor who's watching this daily and hourly, and we can't do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. But you can't. I, one thing I did recently was I have a loan that I have to pay off hmm. in ten years, and I decided that I have to save the money now to pay it because if I don't have it, I'd have to take another loan to pay it off. Mm -hmm. So I shopped online for high interest rates. So even though Wall Street is going up and down, our interest rates are going up, which we know from credit cards, um, but you can get more money back on your money. So I just opened a high yield account to save money in. And the difference between that and when I had it in like, I had it in first entertainment for a while, it, it's nothing. You're not making anything off the money. Now I'm making every month, I'm making $100, $119. It's going up every month and it's less money I have to save. So it, I, I don't know, I want to live off it, but, and there is a $250,000 limit in terms of FDIC insurance. So you can only put that much money in that account at the end. And then you have to go do another one. And by then the interest may be coming down. Who knows? Is there a minimum? Not really. I don't, I don't, there may be a minimum. Some of them have minimums. Like you have to put a thousand dollars in. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there are some that are $5,000, but this was not, I, I mean, there's like three or four that are really quite good. Uh, if you if you look online, I mean, I believe in having your money make money for you as much as possible. You're so good at that, Betsy. What do you consider a good rate right now? Well, what am I, I'm getting four four point something on one of them. Okay. It just changed. It just changed, so I don't even know what it is exactly. I just got a note that said, "Hey, you're lucky. Your rate's going up." You know. Um, and I know what Wendy was saying about the investment group. I mean, the reason I've stayed with Fidelity over these years, I did have someone else for a while. I had Merrill Lynch. I've tried, I've tried different groups, um, was because <coughs> don't, I do pay a fee in the sense that they get paid a percentage of anything I make, but I don't pay them if I lose. So it is not to their benefit for me to lose. And they do send me a notice telling me what they made, uh, you know, what's coming off for them. But I also have within my investments in Fidelity two accounts that I handle completely. Uh -huh. And I invest on Wall Street or I do whatever I want. They are, they, there's only the ones that are investing. They, the, the investment group within Fidelity knows to keep their hands off that, those two accounts. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Are we done? Have we forgotten anything that we tips we wanted to tell things we uh, that we wanted to be wary of is what I'm trying to think. I mean, I will tell you that I worked when the rule was that you can only work 40 hours during 
uh, after you retired and did the two months of no work, then you could only work 40 hours. I screwed up because I read things sort of backwards. So I, on my time card, wrote exactly 40 hours. I thought that was what it meant. They meant you really can only work less than 40 hours. Right. So now they're more clear. They say you can work up to 50 hours, but you can actually work 49.5. And so it's up to you to watch it. And they caught, you know, I, I wasn't, I didn't mean to make a mistake, but then I had to wait another like two months or something, whatever, to clear that up. It's so easy to make a mistake. But theoretically, once you're, you retire, let's say you retire at 65 and then you're retired two months, you can theoretically go back to work and stop your checks at will. So if a movie comes up for three months, you can do it and you just call and say, I'm starting a movie. And then when you finish, you call and say, you stopped. That's but, where those forms come in. You can call them or they want, MPI wants forms, the IA want, I think. You have to do it in writing. And that's for, for your pension, not Social Security. Or does Social right. Security come up too? No, Social Security is a done deal. You yeah. don't even have to think about that. You just, you'd have to answer to MPI for these other issues. And there's a maximum Social Security, right? You, it's not, an, it's not, because I remember my, my, my tax guy says that the max, you, the max you put in for Social Security is $120,000 a year. So he always suggests my income to that because he's like, there's no reason to pay more than that because you're not getting any benefits from it. I wouldn't know, Sal, because I looked at my account and for, for MPI or whatever I made for the IA, I never made over like $84,000 a year. But I knew how to save money. So, you know, it worked out okay. But one of the things that happened to me is when I hit I was going up and up every year and I hit the writer strike and it, sh this was in the eighties. It shut everything down. I had like a year and a half and without any income from anything, it was ugly and virtually had to start acquiring again because you have a break in service. You have all these things that happen that are a problem that you have to be aware of. And I know that we said CDG doesn't have anybody who works in, under a live television contract. But 705 has people who work under live television and they do not acquire any of this as credited hours. And I did that for the first five years I worked. So the first five years I was like, I what? I didn't know, I just didn't know. Yeah. But another thing is, you know, the lovely contract services, which runs our lives and harasses us constantly to do, to learn lovely things that are necessary. Um, when I moved with the same company from Universal Studios to Sunset Gower, which at that time was a non-union, it may still, I don't know who owns it now, but it was a non-union lot the, back then. Contract Services wrote me a letter and said, we are taking you off of uh, our roster because you are working on a non-union lot. And for some reason, wow. I had the sense to write back and say, I did not choose to move. I am doing the same job for the same company. You cannot do that. And they stepped away. Right. I had the same, I had the same issue when I had the boys and they, excuse me, they threatened to take me off the roster. <clears throat> excuse me. And I wrote a mom apple pie and the American flag letter. And like you, they backed right off. Well, it's interesting that these rules aren't absolute. So I'm just going to say this. I'm going to interrupt. Anytime you um, you write a letter to contract services and say that, they will back off. That's their policy. It is it, So they send it because they think you're not interested, you haven't worked. But as soon as you send the letter, they back off. That is just across the board. They'll do it for anyone. That needs to be really um, advertised to our people. We're not on a roster. It oh, well, to, okay, 705. It needs, to be, it needs to be advertised to 705. Yeah. It will confuse, it will confuse our people if we, uh, yeah. but that's <laughs> <Sorry>. just, <laughs> yeah. What is that, Betsy, what's that thing, stop, stop in service? Break in service. Break in service. Break in service, yeah. That can really be a drag. If you can't work for two years for whatever reasons, um, maybe it was COVID, 
they you, it's like you have to start over on your hours i'm not sure what the situation is i think you can do something so that you don't lose because they will you will lose all that previous yeah, that's what the. Although I find that hard to believe, I would have to look and maybe. maybe oh, during the pandemic, they made allowances for us. I think they yeah, did during. Right. The pandemic. Yeah, they did. But, um, I just read this last night and I went, "Whoa, that's kind of scary." I mean, I'm to. When you say start over again, you mean just work up the whatever six hundred hours is to reactivate. You don't mean start over. Well, no, I they I they actually make. If you have a break in service, there's a chart here. Let me find the chart so that I'm talking correctly. But there's a chart here that has is an example of someone who worked for like three years and then um, didn't work for two years. But isn't there a vested a point? Yeah, I mean, after and 30 years. Have, yeah, I think it, if you're vested, it doesn't happen to you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm now fully vested. It's my I'm in my 30th year, so I don't have to worry about breaking service. Yeah. Right. No. And um, is that true, Brigida? Brigida. I think she left I'm us. Sorry, I'm sorry, I couldn't get to it. Um say ask that question again. I said that once you're fully vested, I'm in my 30th year. Does a break in no, service no. still still a, no, it doesn't uh, matter? Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't matter. So so it goes like this. So you have five years of service, you have a break in service, you have five more, you have two wow. years break in service. All those years that counted, you don't start all over again. You literally have those five and then those two, and then you have to do the other. Like it's so you've got 10 after 15 years. So if you've covered your, your 400 hours, uh, 600 hours, 400 hours, 400 hours per you know, qualifying period, that's a vested year. You don't start over from ground zero. You have that one, even if you had that one and then you had three years of a break in service. Okay, just to be like the idiot here. After 30 years, if, I, if, I, if something were to happen and I didn't work for a year or two, I'm not going to get a break in service. Yeah, you're never, you may have a break in service and not get your insurance right now, but you're fully vested. So okay, that's just like saying. I'm fully vested after 20 years, even though I've had breaks in services. So, um, yes, you're fully vested. Um, one last point that I wanted to point out that I learned when I retired is um, because I might want to go back to work. I was, I was under the impression that I was going to retire from IATSE. Um, but no, you don't want to do that if you think you're going back to work. So you continue making your dues payments. Is that correct? So if you're, yes, you never want to, so MPI and the IA are two different things. Right. Um, retiring from MPI has nothing to do with retiring from the IA. If you retire from the IA, you have one chance to go back. If you do both retirements, which means you retire at 65 and then you retire at 75, you can never go back. Okay. So um, you literally, if you plan on working, you have to stay with IA. Yes. That was and that was something you can, that I you can get an honorably an honorable withdrawal where you're not considered an IA member and you can come back at any time if you don't want to pay your dues. But if you do that, then you have to pay all the um back dues. Back dues yeah, if you come back. Right. And you're also not considered a member, which for me, I don't want that. 